For years, farmers and ecologists have been trying to outfox the fox. In fact, you could say that the damage that foxes do affects all of us, given the impact on biodiversity and food production. So that makes the work that my next guest is doing all the more fascinating and urgent. G'day, Ranger Mel here, back with another Betong Bungalow. And I'm sitting here in Mulligan's Flat Sanctuary on traditional land, the land of the Ngunnawal people. As I sit on the ground here, I think about the Ngunnawal elders, past, present and emerging, who've cared for this country for 65,000 years, and I really thank them for it. Tim Andrew Arthur is an ecology student with the ANU Fenner School of Environment Society and also happens to be one of our outreach officers at Mulligan's Flat. Tim, I think we're going to blow people's minds today with the research you are doing and also with the fox control because it doesn't talk about baiting, culling or shooting in the traditional sense. But first of all, tell me, what impacts are foxes having on native animals? Certainly, Mel. And so at the minute, foxes are having a really devastating impact on native animals. Uh, particularly animals falling within that critical weight range of um, it's about 30 grams up to about five and a half kilos. Um, so mammals in that weight range are really, really vulnerable to fox predation. But on top of that, a uh, large number of other species are also damaged by the fox and also outcompeted. So it's become a real issue here in Australia. Um, and so at the moment, foxes have actually caused huge losses to biodiversity. And there was one study that actually mapped the spread of the fox across the landscape from their initial uh, introduction into Australia. And when you're looking at that, you can actually see how as the fox spread, there are a whole range of local extinction events. And in, in, including our betongs that you know, we have here inside our protective fence. Exactly that. And um, the small burrowing mammals are one of the groups that have suffered the, the worst losses because of fox predation. Um, and even if you're not into biodiversity, as much as we are here at the Trust, um, on an agricultural scale, $17 million in losses for sheep production? Is that right? That's oh, the kind 100%. of huge and amount of uh, damage they do? And the majority of that occurs during uh, lambing when foxes will mm. come in and, and take... It's actually during the pregnancy, the birth itself, the fox will rush in and grab the yes. newly born lamb at that moment when the, the animal is most vulnerable. So they're not only really damaging, but really clever in how they go about it. And that's why it's become such a difficult problem to try and untangle. So this is um, affecting all of us at any level in the cities, in the um, country areas. But what is the conventional way up until now <clears throat> that we have dealt with foxes? How do we deal with them at the moment? And that's a really good question. So up until recently, it's mainly been a focus on uh, population management. So we're looking at, we know we've got the fox in the landscape and we're just targeted on trying to get the numbers as low as possible. We have an idea that that will minimize the damage. And uh, the current main techniques used for that are, are shooting, baiting, uh, and 1080 baiting, using 1080, 1080 baiting, mm -hmm. but also pap baiting. So there are innovations going on in baiting to try and adjust welfare and also some of the long-term uh, concerns surrounding baiting, such as bait shyness, but we'll talk about that a little later. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, there's also trapping, but with trapping, often the end point is also going to be lethal management and the fox will be destroyed. So. And we're sitting just next to the exclusion fence we, fence we have here at Mulligan's Flat. Um, are they also part of the control for some areas? And that's a really good question. So exclusion fencing is something that's being done to allow the reintroduction of our native species. And that's been part of the problem with the fox is uh. even when uh, fox management has been done on an area and the population is reduced as low as possible, there will still be some foxes existing in that area. They're really cryptic and hard to eradicate. And on top of that, they have a huge capacity for migration. So if you create a hole in the landscape where there aren't any foxes, that's perfect habitat for a new fox to move into. And they will very rapidly identify that gap in the landscape and move in. So we maybe what we have been doing to date could actually be making the problem worse with foxes? A hundred percent. And that's a really big issue that we've got because whenever you do some kind of action upon a population, you will actually be selecting for actions which counteract that effect. Uh, so any that's kind a, That's of a hard thing to hear, I suppose, for people who've been putting a lot of effort into this. Yeah, but at the same time, it's something that's been necessary because with our current techniques, this was the best solution that we had. And on top of that, there have been a lot of great successes achieved by baiting and really innovative ways to go about how we do it. So mm. for instance, baiting in buffer zones and other tactics like that, as well as provision of habitat, has actually allowed the successful reintroductions of some species. However, for other animals, the uh, pressure put on them by fox predation is simply too great. And so it's led to a situation where without the 
construction yeah. of exclusion <laughs> fencing bases. like this, it actually becomes impossible for some mm. native species to survive in the presence of foxes. Yes. Um, so it's and much as we love our fence here at Mulligan's mm. Flat, this was very expensive to put in. A hundred percent. Not every farmer has the level of, um, you know, backing that we got to put this fence in. A hundred percent. And on top of that, it then creates a population mm. that where it isn't able to have connectivity to other populations around the area. And That's so right. while they're a really good solution in the meantime, and it can also allow for animals to exist in the presence of their other predators, uh, allowing the continuation of anti-predator defences, it does lead to other potential problems mm. and sanctuaries like this will have a carrying capacity. It is a finite area. That's and right. so Let's turn to some of your research. And first I want to talk about um, some of the work you've done with your supervisor, Professor Adrian Manning, um, when it looks at how we can really get ahead of this fox. How are you looking, or what research have you looked at overseas where we can start to manipulate foxes, in a sense, to make them less lethal to animals? Certainly. And so... We're starting to look into these new ideas surrounding the idea of uh, non-lethal tactics and trying to adapt the predator uh, to either be helpful in some way in the environment, okay. such as in Australia, the fox actually has a, an important role in keeping rabbit populations down. That's and so true, yes. Without the existence of other predators, if we simply controlled the fox, there would potentially be explosions in rabbit population, mm. which would have other far-reaching impacts. Yeah, and erosion and things like that. So you've been looking at, and it's a, it's a big concept, conditioned taste aversion, which I sort of feel like it's my five-year-old looking at a green veggie and saying, yuck, even though she hasn't tried it. A hundred percent, and that's exactly the... Uh, what is it? What is the conditioned taste aversion? It that's exactly the analogy I like to use. And yeah. so the best way to think of it is when you've gone to a, a restaurant you might have previously loved and mm -hmm. had a meal that's just made you violently ill. And oh, that chicken I, parmi at the pub last exactly. week. I'm not touching another chicken parmi for and a while. You, yeah. I personally have had an yeah. experience where just going past the restaurant and thinking about going in <laughs> made me start to feel a bit nauseous. And so how do you then translate this to the fox world? And exactly that. So at the moment, we're starting to look into this idea of uh, bait shyness, which has been explored. Mm -hmm. And this is something I mentioned previously. It's one of the limitations we've seen in uh, the use of poison baits. Uh, it's not across the board, but for some foxes, we've actually observed that if there is a partial consumption of a bait, ah. it will actually lead to the fox uh, experiencing nausea, but not actually uh, experiencing mortality as a result of the poison so within the bait. So they know, last time I went near one of those things, I got really sick, so pff, I'm exactly. heading out. Okay, so then what do you start to do? Uh, so we're starting to think about, well, what are some other strategies that we can use uh, to adapt the fox to mm -hmm. make it less damaging to our native species while allowing it to continue having some positive impacts in the environment, such as predation of rabbits. And these non-lethal tactics are looking at the idea of aversive conditioning. So can we actually get the fox to associate a particular type of behaviour with a negative consequence? Okay. Um, and there's some really interesting, exciting ways that people have started to look into going overseas? about this kind of aversion. Yeah, okay, 100%. so what sort of um, case studies have been done overseas with this? Uh, a lot of work's actually been done in America looking at the coyote because mm -hmm. over there in America, coyote predation uh, leads to losses to livestock. And so it's something land managers are having to deal with all the time. And they've started to look at, first of all, if you fed an animal uh, a piece of a sheep, but mm -hmm. with some kind of poisoned agent within mm -hmm. it, uh, that would make the coyote violently ill, but uh -huh. not actually lead to uh, mortality, it will actually reduce its consumption of that type of meat in the future. So a bit like you walking past the pub and saying, mm -mm, I'm starting to feel sick, it will walk past the sheep and say, mm -mm, last time I ate one of those things, I was very sick. Is exactly. that the concept? Exactly that. Wow. And okay. this, it's actually been done on a number of different species too. There was actually uh, one study that you can find on YouTube where they it's, qu it's quite a dramatic video, uh -huh. so just a, a warning in okay. advance, but <laughs> yes. you can actually find a video of a wolf that is averted to predating upon a sheep. And so, first of all, when the animal is put in the pen with the sheep, the wolf predates upon the sheep immediately. Uh -huh. But once it had been subjected to this conditioned aversion, yeah. it would approach the sheep, but when it got near and mm -hmm. sent some kind of cue, yeah. it would actually back down and did not wow. predate upon the animal. And after a number of encounters like this, the sheep itself actually started getting bold <laughs> and fronting up on the wolf a little bit. That's so amazing. it's it's quite remarkable to watch and to have seen wow. that occur in a penned example where yes. there wasn't another alternative food source yeah, yeah. available, it does show that there may be some Something potential for yeah, reducing wow. the consumption of one species in the okay. landscape while still allowing the fox to go around to go and, and eat, eat the rabbits. Exactly <laughs> that. So um, 
would it then pass this down to its young? Like it's all very good. You've, you've, you know, had this particular fox has eaten the thing to say, okay, if I eat the betong, I'm going to be sick or the quoll or the whichever species you're trying to protect. How does it then pass it on down through the generations? Or do we have to keep making these foxes sick? And that's a very good question. That's and really it's something we to. just don't know yet. Yeah. Uh, there's different studies on animals and food preferences. And so there is some evidence to suggest that there can be some learning from what the uh, parents' diet mm -hmm. is. But at the same time, we just don't know what the capacity for passing on this kind of learning is. And yes. it's something that needs to be explored. Well, look, back to the five-year-old. I hate mandarins and so does she. And she's never tried one, so... <laughs> 100.